Bom dia, buenos dias, bom giorno, guten morgen, a nossos amigos, professores que estão aqui hoje na casa nos prestigiando. Hoje a PGM retorna a realizar um evento internacional, depois de algum tempo, depois da pandemia, e agradeço imensamente a nossa diretora do Centro de Estudos, Arícia Correia, por se desdobrar para realizar esse evento, ao procurador e professor Rodrigo Brandão, que ele foi fazer, pediu licença para estudos há certo tempo, e eu disse para ele, vá, estude e traga para nós, é, faça esse intercâmbio com professores, e veio através também do professor Ingo, trazendo professores não só daqui do Brasil, que estudam hoje Direito e Tecnologia, mas também prof professores da Alemanha e da Espanha. Então, hoje vai ser um evento, tenho certeza, de bastante profundidade, que nós poderemos estudar o que há de mais atual, contemporâneo no mundo sobre direito e tecnologia, um tema que nos, nos assusta, que nos intriga, que, que impõe fazer investigação mais profunda e, portanto, eu quero agradecer e dizer que a Procuradoria está realmente hoje em festa, muito feliz com a presença de todos os professores e com a possibilidade de sediar esse encontro. Muito obrigado e que tenhamos um excelente evento durante toda a jornada. Muito obrigado. Bom, muito bom dia a todos e todas. É uma alegria imensa para o nosso Centro de Estudos firmar essa parceria com a Universidade Federal do Rio Grande do Sul, com um o Centro de PUC do Rio Grande do Sul, com o, o Centro de Estudos também, é, que proporcionou essa rede para que nós aqui estivéssemos, com o procurador Rodrigo, que na verdade também é o grande idealizador, né, coordenador do nosso do Núcleo de Estudos de, de Direito Constitucional, e a, a essa retomada dos congressos internacionais aqui da Procuradoria-Geral do Município, proporcionada pelo, pelo nosso Procurador-Geral, depois da pandemia e depois de, de muitos anos em que e nós não tínhamos essa oportunidade, no momento em que o direito revisita todos os seus institutos, em função da inteligência artificial, em função dos novos desafios que se impõem ao direito diante da inovação. E começar pelo, por esses desafios do direito à inovação, através do direito constitucional, através do constitucionalismo digital. Obviamente que esses desafios têm, se, é, têm sido impostos à administração pública, também no campo do direito administrativo, vários sistemas hoje brigando aí por competências interfederativas, muitas vezes sistemas impostos pela União, muitas vezes é, usurpando, não necessariamente usurpando, mas compartilhando é, dados que, na verdade, pertencem a outros entes federativos. E essa, esse novo compartilhamento fazendo parte também de uma inovação no campo do direito administrativo, várias questões ligadas ao direito civil também, a direitos personalíssimos, campo do, do direito civil, a inovação também se faz presente em razão da inteligência artificial, sendo o Estado aquele grande depositário fiel de uma big data, de grandes dados sensíveis, não só dos nossos servidores, mas como também dos nossos cidadãos. Então, esse... Congresso é o primeiro congresso de direito e inovação, justamente por essa posição peculiar que o Estado ocupa de ser o grande depositário fiel desses dados, do cidadão, do servidor público, por estar nesta posição, num pacto federativo como o brasileiro, em especial, em que o município, que aqui a Procuradoria-Geral do Município representa, que também ocupa, que também é um ente federativo, também ocupa essa posição na Federação Brasileira, que, portanto, pretende ser o primeiro 
de vários outros congressos de direito e inovação, mas começou justamente pela Constituição, pelo constitucionalismo digital, inteligência artificial e proteção de dados, trazendo aqui os maiores especialistas do mundo para tratar do tema com vocês. Por isso, eu não poderia deixar de também chamar à mesa aqui o professor Ingo Sarnet, professor Rodrigo, para é, falar um pouco dessa organização com vocês. E uma salva de palmas a todos os professores que vieram para brilhantar esse dia. Desculpa. Não, não, fez bem. <risos> Repita. Bom dia a todos. Eu gostaria de agradecer inicialmente ao Procurador-Geral, o doutor e professor Daniel Bucar, pela iniciativa e, de fato, que ele me falou quando ele me concedeu a licença para estudos. Foi exatamente isso, a importância de né, nós resgatarmos a tradição da Procuradoria de Eventos. É, nós tivemos a oportunidade, alguns anos atrás, já há bastante tempo, de organizar eventos muito emblemáticos e, particularmente, na minha área de Direito Constitucional. É, trouxemos professores muito importantes, certamente não, é, não é, designarei todos, mas, por exemplo, o professor Ronald Duor, que é a primeira vez que ele esteve no Brasil, veio através de um convite da Procuradoria-Geral do município do Rio de Janeiro, o professor Dieter Green, é, o professor é, Robert Pouls, assim, nomes muito importantes do Direito Constitucional, vieram é, a, ao Brasil a convite da Procuradoria. É, portanto, a Procuradoria teve um papel importante na organização de eventos e, e nesses eventos, o professor Ingo Sarlet foi sempre um parceiro fundamental. Eu gostaria de é, agradecê-lo pessoalmente. Nós tivemos várias parcerias exitosas em congressos é, que sempre me honraram muito é, ter a parceria do professor Ingo, com a sua capacidade incrível de articulação, seus contatos é, internacionais, o professor Ingo não só é, é uma das maiores, se não a maior autoridade de direito constitucional no Brasil, como é, é certamente o professor com um nível de articulação internacional incrível e, e sempre foi muito generoso com a Procuradoria-Geral do município em... É, né, fazer essa parceria que sempre nos é, beneficiou muito. É, agradecer também à doutora é, Arícia Correia pelo apoio do Centro de Estudos e, em nome dela, eu agradeço todos os funcionários da Procuradoria que assim tiveram bastante trabalho para viabilizar esse congresso. E, por fim, agradecer a todos os palestrantes. É uma honra enorme ter aqui professores da importância da professora Indra Speaker, do professor Christoph Bursch, do professor Ricardo Campos, do Antônio Pérez Mira, Giacomo Palombini, Gabriele Sarlet, o próprio professor Ingo Sarlet, que eu já citei, é, fazem com que seja um congresso, de fato, de muito peso, um congresso muito relevante para estudar temas, eu não vou adiantar, evidentemente, aqui o escopo do congresso, teremos um dia inteiro para discutir, mas temas muito relevantes né? para nós entendermos um pouco melhor as conexões entre direito e inovação. Então, não quero me alongar, renovando meus agradecimentos ao Procurador-Geral e meu amigo Daniel Bucá. Bom dia a todas e todos. É uma grande honra e uma alegria poder estar aqui, e pelo visto saber que isso é o primeiro Congresso Internacional pós-pandêmica, organizada aqui pela Procuradoria do Município, né, e saudar aqui especialmente no Procurador-Geral, o professor Dr. Daniel Bucar, doutora Alicia Correia, também já amigos né, de alguma data, o querido amigo né, Rodrigo Brandão, né, e para aqui agora representando institucionalmente na né, PUC do Rio Grande do Sul, a Escola de Direito, e o nosso programa de pós-graduação em Direito, que eu tenho a honra de coordenar, né, também saudar os nossos palestrantes, né, já o Nuno Minas, mas não... Custa repetir também, né, os, pela sua a presença, é realmente inestimável né, no, nesse evento, né, em tantas outras parcerias que tem feito né, 
eh, com outras instituições brasileiras, a professora Indra Speaker, né, o professor Christoph Burchardt, o professor Antônio Pérez Miras, Giacomo Palombini, Ricardo, né, Gabriele, né, e aqui também em nome do Ricardo e Gabriele, os demais palestrantes nacionais né, que vão hoje à tarde né, participar desse esse evento. Né. É, é uma grande satisfação, aqui tem alguns detalhes, né, de fato nós fizemos algumas excelentes parcerias já com a aqui com o Centro de Estudos, com a Procuradoria Geral do Município do Rio Grande do Sul. Né? Essa, foi, o Rodrigo deu apenas alguns exemplos. Né? Tivemos também Peter Heberle, né? tivemos Mark Tushner, tivemos, é, sem falar outros professores que vieram aqui já ao longo de tantos anos, né? pré-pandêmicos. Né? Então, uma grande uma grande alegria também pessoal né? que a gente possa retomar é, essa, essa parceria, né? que também é uma triangulação, né? porque né, os colegas... É, alguns já passaram, outros vão passar agora também por Brasília, pelo IDP, né, por Porto Alegre. Né, então, isso de fato é uma coisa que é, é muito estimulante também, intelectual e, e pessoalmente. Né, e, então, além do mais, tem um outro detalhe aqui que é muito caro para mim, agora pessoalmente, né, não só pela PUC, mas para mim pessoalmente como acadêmico, e também, não só pessoal e academicamente, é, é que, de algum modo, no Rio, embora tenha também bons amigos em outras instituições, né, a maior concentração né, é com a UERJ, né? então, a ala do direito público e até do direito privado né, da, da UERJ, né, e me é particularmente muito querida, né, seja para os amigos que eu fiz e ainda tenho feito, seja pelo respeito intelectual também que eu tenho, né, não só pela instituição da UERJ, mas por todos esses colegas queridos, são grandes nomes também no nosso direito público, brasileiro, né? e, e também, e também é, porque a UERJ foi um dos primeiros centros que me acolheu academicamente. Né? O professor Ricardo Lobo Torres, o professor Celso Albuquerque Melo, o professor Barroso, né? foram os primeiros a me acolher, né? o professor Bonavides, o professor Clemson Clef, o professor Gilmar Mendes, foram os primeiros, digamos assim, padrinhos né? da minha carreira acadêmica como palestrante, professor convidado, membro de bancas, então é com muito carinho também pessoal, né, acadêmico, que eu me sinto ligado aqui ao Rio de Janeiro e à Procuradoria e também né, aos queridos colegas da UERJ, coincidentemente são colegas da, da UERJ, né, professores também aqui. Então, muito obrigado também por tudo isso. Bom, então... Desejando um bom congresso, vamos desfazer a mesa e já iniciando o nosso congresso com a próxima palestra de abertura, que será com a professora Indra Spica, professor Ingo Sarlet e o professor Christoph Burra, com inteligência artificial e direitos fundamentais. Muito obrigado. Então, é, dando início é, ao painel... Inteligência Artificial e Direitos Fundamentais. É, a primeira palestrante é a professora Indra Speaker. A professora Indra Speaker é professora titular em Direito Público, Ambiental e Informacional em Teoria é, do Direito na Universidade Goethe, em Frankfurt. É, sou muito grato à professora Indra Speaker. Ela me recebeu maravilhosamente em Frankfurt, uma cidade que eu, eu aprendi a gostar muito. Espero voltar em breve. Tive uma experiência é, excelente lá por alguns meses em que eu vivi é, e fico feliz de recebê-la no Rio de Janeiro. É, ainda bem que tivemos dias bonitos e que, de alguma maneira, é, ela pôde novamente vir ao Rio é, num, né, numa semana de dias ensolarados, aproveitar um pouco é, algumas das maravilhas aqui do Rio de Janeiro. Não é uma cidade tão organizada, tem os seus problemas, mas é uma cidade que tem os seus encantos e, e sem dúvida, que é, o clima ajudou. Então, fico muito feliz de recebê-la aqui em nossa casa, na Procuradoria-Geral do Município, e passo a palavra à professora Indra. Hum. Bom dia a todos e todas. E é tudo que eu vou dizer em português. Eu me desculpe. É great honor to be here again and it's a beautiful city um, and I cannot relate to anything you just said about this being chaotic or unorganized or something it's I mean what can you want a city under the sugar loaf with beaches and with a municipal theater like that it's fantastic 
Um, I'm very grateful that Ingo Zalet made it possible, that Rodrigo Bandao made it possible, that Arisha Carrera went up on it, that Daniel Bukhar liked the idea of me coming here and to speak about a topic which I'm convinced that it is a topic of highest interest to all the democracies in the world because we see that they are very, very exciting but also potentially threatening developments. And for um, a state institution, so I'm really grateful to the Procuraduria that you are taking this topic up and that you are taking it up on an international level, that you're aware that having the foundation of data, having the tools potentially, that the state is potentially under very special obligations and that many of the dangers that we see and as lawyers, we talk about the dangers. We leave the floor to others to tell us what's good about it. That in this particular circumstance, we're discussing the potential dangers for the data, but also for the use of that data. If states use it, if a procuradoria uses it, um, the same as privates use it, we see problematic. I did bring a PowerPoint presentation, and I hope that we're able to put it on the screen, we do, perfect. Um, and I can tell you technology functions so much better in Brazil than it does in German <laughs> conferences. Um, let's uh, start and let's see where do I have to point this at. Mm. Yeah. There we go, perfect. Um, we're in an exciting age. Information technology in the past what is it, 50 years maybe? Um, and there are enough of in among us who remember times when a laptop was not something everybody had, when smartphones were not even thinkable, when the most exciting thing was to plug in a modem in the 1990s and then wait for an email, one, to come through in half an hour or something. Um, that's uh, a lot of things happening. It's uh, the internet came up, we all live with it, but it was impossible to communicate as we did prior to our stay here. Big data is there. Um, automated decision making, um, assisted automated decision making has become an everyday thing for all of us. Artificial intelligence is just the tip of the iceberg, I think. There's much more to speak about, like ubiquitous computing, and we're already talking quantum computing, which will make all the artificial intelligence, the big data processing even more easily accessible um, and the data, the IT, much more prone to be in everything we encounter. As I said, they are not only good and bad, and as I'm the first one on this podium, I will develop a little bit what we're talking about. For example, HIV treatment is not thinkable anymore as a legal artist treatment if there wasn't AI, um, because now you get a cocktail of many different medications depending on the particular mutations you get, which is continuously adjusted. A single doctor is unable to combine this information. We're talking about the CERN, which is the largest worldwide physics uh, collider, um, where we have very exciting physics uh, information coming out of uh, simulation data, which is produced by AI. And that is um, in a rate which nobody, if it wasn't for a computing, quantum computing already uh, to do that. We see also that in some states in this world, we have access to secondary education now according to the prior behavior of parents, of friends of the parents, etc., etc., social scoring. And we also see um, if we access WhatsApp, if we access uh, Facebook, if we access any type of social media now, that we have personalized news, selected information um, according to what we liked prior, what we accessed, how long we accessed it, etc. We see virtual worlds coming up, the meta um, universe is a part of this, and we see that online gaming uh, is now assisting in assessment of people's behavior in the real world out there. So these are examples of the good and the bad. So AI, which I'm concentrating on, and I'll expand it a little bit to automated decision making, is neither good nor bad. It depends as so many technologies on its use, and I would like to consider it as a tool, like a hammer. The one who uses the hammer better knows how to use a hammer, otherwise you have at best a blue thumb, um, and at very best a nail in the wall. So um, we do have to consider on the effects, and I will concentrate on human rights. 
Let's start with what artificial intelligence is. And I suppose, and I've seen so many excellent lectures in my time in Brazil in the past two weeks, that I needn't really say much about it. It's a common term. It's a fuzzy term. It's not something that you can really grab unless you're a computer scientist. And um, basically, it is, and that's the important part, it's something that simulates. You could even say it feigns um, features of intelligence, but it is not intelligence. It is not um, something that reasons. And I'll very quickly just draw upon this. There is no truth behind uh, artificial intelligence. There is no understanding of the machine. There is no context relatedness. There is no mindfulness. Um, and certainly, we don't have surprises, because it is based strictly on probability and correlation. And that means, even if we think ChatGPT offers us an intelligent solution to a question we have. It doesn't. It just displays what it thinks is most likely. And that's, and I guess all of you have experienced that, is why it makes up things. It doesn't make up things. It doesn't sit there and say, oh, I don't know, and I have to come up with an answer, like a six-year-old in school or something. But it simply says, OK, I find the most probable answer. And if to us who have understanding, the most probable answer makes absolutely no sense, that is the tool function. We are still there to control for it. What is artificial intelligence in a computer sense? It's a wide area of technologies. I'm not going to go into detail, and I'm not competent to speak about this. Um, it started out with decision trees, but of course it advances into neural networks, into deep learning, and what more there is. So what does it do with? the Constitution. Lots. I'll concentrate on the human rights perspective. When I spoke to the Constitution or the Supreme Court in Brasilia, then I was uh, given the chance to talk a bit more on democracy, which I think is very heavily affected also. But it all is intertwined. So um, I ask for your apology already um, if I sometimes do a little detour into democracy. Rio is fantastic, and I went to a place to look at Rio from its best. That's the other side. <clears throat> and I admit, I also wanted to see the Niemeyer building. Um, it was a super great tour there. As you can see, this was taken yesterday. Um, but it also had two very interesting uh, presentations there. And one was by Rodrigo Prodosa. And um, basically, he was describing something which would fit perfectly into what AI does to human rights. And that is, it creates individuality, but not in the sense we have seen individuality so far as something which allows us freedom, development. But rather, it creates individual entities in which we feel lost. And I'm not going to go into detail in this psychological dimension. I just like the idea that in a museum which was displaying um, individualities, individual persons in great stress is something which is very modern. And there was also an exhibition, um, and I didn't take the pictures in here, on what the internet, what the virtual world does with the real world. But let's be a little bit more optimistic than what I read yesterday, but not too much, I'd say. Um, I'll concentrate on one important effect or tool of uh, AI and how AI automated decision-making systems are being used, and that is personalization. Personalization functions if you have the data. The state has the data, but we are aware that it's now privates who have the data. Second thing is, if someone gave me a USB stick, a quantum computer with data, so what? what am I going to do with it? You need the IT to use the data. So you need the combination of both. And who has that? So far, it's mostly private companies. If you have the data and if you have the information technology, and all of the AI presently is produced mostly by private entrepreneurs, then you have immediately a huge power asymmetry between those who have data plus information equaling power and those who are being judged, assessed, decided, um, selected according to it. The interesting part, and this is where the democracy thing comes into play, is that we don't see, as we traditionally look at it, the state being the superpower and having all the power. But now we see privates. 
And so what we need to reconsider, and I'll come back to that just a little bit, is how do we deal with private power if it equals state power to a certain extent? How does personalization now work? Basically, and this is just a very rough description, is you have data which is being processed, individualized data. You use it to formulate group characteristics. Um, you have data processing, and the data processing is done by IT, by companies, by the state, etc., etc., on the individual. But the individual doesn't really count. So that's the first thing to, to understand. Meta is not interested in you. Meta is interested, and that's the second step, as you, as being the producer of certain information on you as a typical part of a particular group. So you identify that if you were a 45-year-old woman with freckles and having glasses, you have a tendency to like red dresses, whatever. Um, and women in that age who like red dresses also happen to read a particular book. And they also tend to educate their children in a particular way. And the children who have a mother who likes to wear red dresses and is in the mid-40s and therefore blah, 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 tend to perform well in school or kindergarten, but not very well at university because they're spoiled brats. Something like this is the story of what is being told. So the child who happens to have such a mother, poor my child, for example, um, then is being judged according to those group characteristics. And that, again, is probability. So if you have, <laughs> thanks a lot. Um, so if you have um, these characteristics, and there's a probability of 80% not finishing school, why should I send or accept such a child at a federal university where state money is spent on child children education, on students? There's a 20% chance one out of five will drop out and not finish. Let's spend money elsewhere. And that's that. Maybe you are not one of those one out of five. Who determines whether 80% is the margin? But that is how personalization works. And if it is a probability we can be lucky, most of the times it's correlation only. So you like to swim. And the correlation is you like to watch birds because that happens to have some coincidental value. Doesn't have to be a normative value of any sorts. Artificial intelligence and automated decision making make use of this characteristics. So what do we see? We see there is an external determination because you are presented with certain information according to those standards. There's a particular input. The world out there changes. It becomes a virtualized, a fragmentized world, the filter bubbles, and they re-establish themselves. So we are not getting information freely by chance, which might also be biased or whatever, but we get deliberately assigned information. And that is sometimes even automated if you think of social bots, etc., etc. That is very close to what I would call manipulation. But be aware, often it is not some nasty bitch standing there wanting to manipulate this, but it's just a reproduction of probability and probability and probability. And the problem is, we don't see that. Because from a decision, you cannot see what is the information that went into the decision. I don't know why you're sitting here. I assume you're sitting here because you're interested, maybe because your supervisors forced you to and ask you to afterwards present something or so. But that is my natural assumption. You think you were accessed here because your interest, your supervisor, your work, your job, whatever. But maybe you were selected because you like to wear red dresses, because you have children of a particular type, because you're supposed to get the impression that everybody is concerned with the topics we're talking about, blah, 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 blah. We don't know. We simply can't see that from the decision result. And finally, all of this is happening extremely fast. It's real time and it's m way more than real time. If you think, if, if you'll ask me questions and I'll be sitting here and I'll be, hmm, okay, good question. And while I say good question, my brain is working. Real time in computer is much faster than that. So we are fast and furious, 
and unfortunately it's copyrighted, the pictures of the Fast and Furious series. Um, so that is true for action, but it is also true for the reaction. So virtual communication is much faster and it's not retraceable anymore. Keep that in mind when we're talking about the human rights part, because communication is the essence of human beings. Human beings are social beings and they communicate. That was the introduction. I'll continue now with more concise challenges and I'll give a few solutions. And I said, let's be a bit more optimistic, but not too much. And then I'll have to do a very short conclusion. Where is the human in the constitution? Everywhere. And I'm not a legal philosopher. There will be German legal philosophers in Brazil next week, and they can much better speak about this. But the constitution, any constitution in the world, is of course very, very focused on the human being. That's the essence of constitutions since the first constitutions came up. It's an individualistic, human-oriented approach. Well, what we see is that we have a judgment by probability. And that means we are looking into the past. And I assume there are a few people here who still remember what this is, a tape. And I guess some of you remember how you taped your first rock and roll songs on that and how the tape broke and how you had to rewind it again, things like that. If we lived in a world determined by AI, we'd still be doing that because that's what everybody had. So there is no surprise, no learning, no, oh, I didn't know this person was so interested and so interesting, being so different from I. All of those experiences are something in a world of probability which are not really existent. That affects the autonomy of human beings. It affects their individuality because you're all of a sudden always part of a group and, of course, in the essence of freedom. So all the human rights are affected and everything in the Constitution is affected because there are humans everywhere and that's what a Constitution does. So even if we're talking about state organization, having started with such a general point, let's look a little bit closer. And I said there was an interesting exhibition yesterday. Um, this is the typical thing, what we read about AI nowadays. Discrimination, etc., etc. So that you're being grouped and that you're discriminated and that it is just being added to what you have experienced. Well, there's more to it. Yes, there is the discrimination debate. And it is sometimes tagged by the garbage in, garbage out thing. But garbage in, garbage out is much more than discrimination. It is basically a question of what is the quality of data? How do you assess data? How do you value data? What is neutrality, objectivity of data? Whom can you trust that information comes from that goes into an AI process? And how do you differentiate? So discrimination might be at the end of it. What there is is a display by the AI of the world in a particular way. It's redescribing because of the data that goes in. So if you have tons of data from a particular source and you lack other sources, then the AI will learn that the world is like that one source describes it. And that is much more than just discrimination. That is what if you use AI as a prosecutor or something, you have to keep in mind. If you use AI in the courtroom as a police officer to determine whom to stop or not, where does it come from? Where is the data accumulated that tells you this person with a probability of X is potentially, whatever, homicidal? The second problem is there is no such thing as equality. And that is good because innovation lives off the idea that people look at the same things differently, that they have different associations, etc. And discrimination theory, which has not really reached AI much, has told us for a long time, if you want to anti-discriminate, to de-bias, you have to first identify someone as being in the discriminatory group, etc., etc., or being discriminatory, being discriminated. So that identifies exactly that, what you don't want to be of an importance. And again, an AI learns, hey, that's an important factor. Hmm. 
second thing is discrimination is a normative concept. It's differentiation that is normatively unwanted. So who determines that? And then we're back to the private and the state power. It is the idea of IT companies nowadays, of AI companies, that they differentiate. They want to learn about their customers. They want to know what differentiates the customers. So we don't have to do a general display in marketing or whatever, but that we can really pinpoint and use the assets perfectly. It's the business model to differentiate. And whether or not it's a differentiation we don't want, that is the matter of the law of society, etc. But the differentiation that is in AI is there, and it is in the business model. Second point is we see a lot of standardization. It has run under the code is law, but by now we have also law is code. When we're talking about privacy by design, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, when we see that we access intuitively by now, but we've learned it all, talk to your grandparents, um, how to access the internet, how to use certain things. We find that is, is intuitive. Our grandparents' parents don't. So that makes it very clear how much we are already standardized in our thinking according to what the code has basically said. And then finally, how far does the right to be treated equal really go? Maybe I don't want to be treated equally. Maybe I want to be seen in my individuality. And therefore, do we not only have to think about any human right to equality also in the sense of a right to inequality? And how far and in which situations? Next human right. Let's consider press. We have information intermediaries which say, we're no press. We're just there to distribute information that others give us. We don't have any rights, responsibility, obligations. That's behind the concept. Press, at least in the German constitution, is way more than just a protection of the press. It also says the press has a mass media influence, and therefore we have to consider what is the influence and how can we deal with it. So there are strict regulations on neutrality, objectivity, checking sources, etc., etc. We have to look at those intermediaries now differently. Is there a differentiation possible according to clicks to the range they have? Can there be some sort of content control without reducing the freedom of opinion that we do want, the discourse, the democratic backbone? The EU is trying that now with the Digital Services Act, and we'll see where that leads us with human rights. We have to think not only of what is protected, but also what is a potential violation and infringement. Offline and online context are totally different. The consequences, just think of a shit storm. It makes it different whether you get 50 letters from your constituency, or whether you get within 50 minutes, five million Brazilians just <laughs> biting at you. A lot of politicians have experienced that. And that's why they refrain from becoming politicians or remaining politicians. It is something that if you're in the public office, is something that's a continuous threat. You do something wrong, the virtual world kills you. Controllability is a big um, problem here. Um, would you mind moving a little bit so that I can see? <laughs> Nice technology here. Um, controllability, again, is a, is a big thing here. If you don't see that there's an infringement because you don't feel it, because you can use information many, many times, um, you don't get a beep or um, a little electric shock every time that Meta uses your data um, illegally. If that was the case, we'd all be sitting here you now um, like those fish in, in the Amazon that um, react um, and have those. Um, so we, we have problems, but we have to read that into the dogmatics of infringements, really. Also, the effectiveness of any countermeasures. We are used to personality rights violations. OK, you get a little bit of money. Or if it's a newspaper, then a newspaper publishes that it was wrong what they said weeks later. That doesn't work in a virtual world. It's fast. People forget. They don't forget, but the next day something else is going on. So you have to be fast. You have to use digitalized tools in order to assess that. And of course, there's a lot of times third-party consequences. 
if data is being processed well, it's nice for you to consent, but under the regime of personalization, it means that I, who never consented, will be judged according to data that someone else provided, which might be disassociated without the context, etc. We need to think of new digital tools out there. And there are some people who say robotics and robots should have their own legal personality. I'm a great fan of Roman law. 2,000 years ago, someone came up with the idea. The AI doesn't like what I'm saying. Um, 2,000 years ago, someone came up with the idea that it would be nice not only to have natural persons, but also have legal persons. Yes. But we see the problems with legal persons when we're talking about corporate law. Responsibility is different if you're in a corporation that has 50,000 euros as a backup or something. How do you deal now with new digital entities? And I'm talking, because we're talking human rights, social bots, which influence the public discourse. We have to make platforms accountable for that, but we also have to make users accountable for it. We have to make it retrievable. We have to maybe establish simply transparency. This is a social bot, an artificial intelligence saying this on the basis of that. Certainly, this doesn't deserve freedom of speech or freedom of press. Those are individualized human rights, not technological rights. We have to think of human rights under the pressure of continuous surveillance. If there is personalization, then we do very quickly have surveillance. The social score in China is a wonderful example of that. And there are countries in Europe who are thinking about this. Um, Italy, for example, is strangely contemplating it. The same entity which stopped ChatGPT because of data protection violations. It is the determination of the future. We see that the use of rights can all of a sudden be attributed as something negative. I go to an assembly, which is my good right, and all of a sudden, because the AI uses that as an assessment factor, my children will get not get into a private school. Thanks a lot. That's maybe a reason why I wouldn't go to the assembly. What does that do with our human rights? And so maybe there's a discussion going on presently in Germany at least, but I think also worldwide, is there somewhat a right to illegal behavior, which doesn't mean kill someone and get rid of the homicide statute, but that you cannot have a 100% enforcement of certain violations because people need to learn to make decisions and a decision can also be, let's be stupid. That's perfectly okay. Mm. Let me come to a conclusion so that the others have time to say something too. <laughs> there is a volatile situation for human rights by digitalization, by AI, by automated decision systems. And that is because the state has the power and private entities have the power. So the human who is protected by human rights, the individuality, the autonomy, the freedom, is encountered and enclosed now with new standards and new attributions. We see that human rights change in their importance. Data protection for a few centuries was something for some experts, some strange, odd ones. Now all of a sudden it's in the middle. And if it's in the middle of a discussion, then why? Because there are interests which are threatened by data protection. Don't forget that. If there are people saying we need data sovereignty, we don't need data protection, think who is it and why do they not want it. Telecommunications rights, press, we thought we know what press and media are. No, we don't. Telecommunication, the internet, net neutrality, all become issues. The intensity of infringements are extremely difficult to assess for the individual, so we need new dramatic standards. We also need to think of how do overcome institutions change. I talked about media. Think about assembly. What if I stand in the street and hold up, I'm against whatever, and someone streams that? By German constitutional law, just me standing there would not be an assembly. I would not be protected. It would just be my freedom of speech. But if it's streamed, 50,000 people watch that. That has somewhat of an assembly power, which is thought by the protection of assembly. 
We have to think of state power, of private power, and what if they merge? What if they interact? Think of the American systems which are now being established in the police. And the deal is quite clear. They get the data that the police accumulates. It's a different whether you hand over data to maybe an agency, a regulatory agency for chemical plants, for medication, pharmaceuticals or something, or whether that data immediately is transferred into private hands, because that's the deal behind all of this. And AI presently is developed by privates. Courts, and I take an exception after I heard Judge Barroso speak, um, in Germany definitely, and I'm not sure whether any German institution similar to the Procuradoria would ever do such an event. Um, so Brazil lets me hope. Uh, but courts in general are not very well equipped. And particular courts of appeal, Supreme Courts, what are they? Old white men, and I don't mean to discriminate against old white men, but it means they have a different experience. They have a different understanding. And so a lot of times they're not educated. And again, big exception here in Brazil. Everyone I have talked to, and maybe that's my particular bubble I was introduced to, um, was extremely knowledgeable. German constitutional lawyers are not in the same sense. And we have to think of social human rights. Your constitution is full. I heard you call it a phone book. Um, your constitution is full of social rights, and it has been very, very highly enforced by your Supreme Court. We have a digital divide, and not only in the sense of old and young, but thinking back to the picture of um, the indigenous, we have a digital divide of people like me who are data protection people and therefore can't use WhatsApp and Uber, and those who have no concerns about that. Um, how do we deal with that? Um, how do we make social rights accessible to everyone? And my final note, and that is more of a, an academic approach, but I think the academic approach has very direct answers for administration, um, for the state, uh, for the use of state data and state IT, is we need to rethink our constitution in digital terms, which I would phrase is the approach of digital constitutionalism, the adaptation of what we have, rather than trying to stick to what we have and ignore digital tools. This is not to say that we need a digital constitution, which is only digitalized. I don't believe that what constitutions and human rights present and promise, individuality, autonomy, freedom, that this is outdated just because of digitalization and AI. Thank you very much. Muito obrigado, professora Indra. Palestra, como todos esperávamos, brilhante, profunda, clara ao mesmo tempo. É um enorme privilégio tê-la aqui na Procuradoria. É, passo a palavra, então, ao professor Christoph Burchard. É, professor Christoph vai falar sobre o futuro da justiça criminal na sociedade de vigilância. Ele é professor de direito criminal da Goethe Universität é, em Frankfurt também. Por favor. Um dia, um, and like my dear colleague Indra Spieker, that was also what you will hear from me in Portuguese, uh, probably for the better. Um, I also would like to thank everyone involved um, for this wonderful invitation. I can only again mirror um, my my deepest uh, thank yous. Uh, it's uh, it's wonderful to be here. So thank you so much for, to Daniel Bucal, to Alicia Carrera, um, to the coordinators of this wonderful conference, to Rodrigo and to Ingo. Um, this is um, an amazing opportunity to um, enter into a dialogue on, on a subject matter which um, will not go away to an extent, uh, for good or bad again. Um, after, now we heard from, from Indra the uh, high 
level stakes um, that, that are in play. Um, I would like to boil it down a little bit um, to, to some criminal law um, issues. Um, I will also venture a little bit into the sphere of legal philosophy um, or legal theory rather. Uh, and I need to, to stick up, if you will, um, to my Frankfurt um, origin in that, um, as you might have heard, um, Frankfurt, the Frankfurt School, especially of criminal law, um, is, um, has a tendency to be critical. So I will, I will um, also um, utter some critical reflections um, on what we are seeing. Um, and finally, uh, I'm of course coming from Germany, which um, has two, two well, footnotes, I think, to make. Um, the first one is that Germans, um, as it was um, uh, far more politically correct, maybe um, addressed by Indra Speaker, Germans tend to be a little tech averse um, in, in that uh, we are, might not be really up to um, the full dates um, of uh, where we could be, and this is uh, indeed great to see um, in your country, in Brazil, um, how um, profound uh, your institutions, um, your academics already um, work and reflect upon um, these new digital technologies. Um, the second um, point that I would like to make as a, as, a, as a German criminal lawyer is that my impression was that in the past there was a one-way one way road. So um, German, especially doctrine, was um, exported from Germany to Brazil or imported in Brazil, but there was not, no really um, a two-way road of um, a real exchange. And I really would like to, to avail myself of the, this opportunity to enter into a dialogue because my impression is um, that uh, we Germans, we, we Europeans can learn a lot um, from, from your um, experiences. Now, um, indeed, what I will talk about um, is um, the future of criminal justice in a big data surveillance um, society. Um, big data and big data surveillance um, are, if you will, wish, the foundations of our digital and maybe even already post-digital societies, um, meaning that um, data is what drives and but also upon which um, um, certain actors thrive, where, um, um, if you will, developments and innovation is um, supposedly, at least, allegedly um, pushed by data on the one hand, but on the other hand, um, as we, for example, can learn um, from Jana um, Susbov's analysis um, of the um, surveillance capitalism, where um, um, the so-called data-driven economy um, uses data information of its users, customers, um, to personalize, predict, individual behaviors and then capitalize um, on that, make money from it. And this, um, as Zuberf has shown um, in her writings on surveillance capitalism, actually is really infringing upon, or at least putting a question mark, a big question mark, um, uh, behind our possibilities of self-determination be it individual or collective. And I think this is something that we need to address um, as a society, as lawyers and criminal lawyers. Now, when we boil this down to criminal um, law, at least the German criminal um, law fields, um, as, as I said, uh, might not yet be there. And there might be this, um, this I don't know whether it's uh, whistling in, in the dark, um, that nothing will happen to criminal law proper because of digitalization um, or the use of data. I have my doubts in that respect, and I would r rather um, imagine, if you will, uh, or bring in some, some more than imaginations, realizations of what criminal law and criminal justice can and actually in some countries already does look like in a big data surveying society. Now, on the one hand, um, you, and I will show you this in my presentation, um, you, there might be a big clash between um, our traditional understandings of what criminal law and the criminal process looks like and a vision um, of big data-driven, surveillance-driven um, criminal justice, present or future. 
And, and this is why there are, um, among traditional criminal um, lawyers, um, very cultural pessimistic, tech pessimistic critiques being marshaled against um, this evil, if you will, um, of technology coming in and transforming our dear um, so-called liberal um, criminal law. But my impression, and this is where um, I would like to, to point you at, is that although um, there is certainly a lot to criticize, and I, I share many of the opinions um, that Indra Spieker has already presented, my impression is that already in our current imaginations, doctrines, and practices, um, there are, if you will, the foundations upon which um, this criminal justice of the future of a big data surveillance society is built upon. So if we really want, um, and that is of course a question mark whether we really want, uh, if we really want to criticize that transformation that criminal justice is undergoing and will undergo under big data surveillance, well then we need to also look at these thriving and driving moments in our current practices and doctrines of criminal law and justice. Now, um, what I will do is I will very briefly go into um, some, some foundations of what I mean with big data, big data um, surveillance and the big data surveillance society. And I will then take out two notions from big data to question um, um, whether big data surveillance actually means the end of normativity of law as law proper. And secondly, whether um, big data surveillance is actually um, the beginning of the end um, of what uh, the Americans would call probable cause. So th that you need um, a certain amount of suspicion to really start an investigation. Now on my first point, the foundations, um, very, very um, briefly. Um, speaking, I'm, I'm very glad that at this place um, um, I'm allowed to talk on a big data surveillance society because that is of course bringing in the whole issues of at times rather fuzzy um, analyses and diagnoses of where our society as a whole um, is, is at, of where our, um, if you will, society is at in a certain phase of time. Now again, these are very fuzzy um, concepts at times, but they might help us um, to focus on certain issues that are of uh, certain grander and bigger um, implications that we then need to address more properly. So the, talking about big data surveillance is a means to focus um, our um, to focus our attention on certain issues. And I have two issues that I would um, uh, would like to focus on with, regard, with, with respect to big data surveillance. Um, big data surveillance, in turn, you can define um, along three um, English Vs. So there is big data in terms of there's a huge amount, a huge volume um, of information available. Uh, um, um, available. The, that data comes from very different sources, so the variety um, of the data is, is um, again, very big. And the amount of computational power that you can now put into analyzing um, that data is getting um, stronger and stronger. So the velocity of analysis um, is being um, pushed to the next level. If we talk about surveillance of big data, um, don't mix that up with this classical Foucaultian um, approach that you only observe. Because what is also now possible with, um, with um, ever more um, possibilities to save that data is that you actually go into saving data and that of course then implies um, data retention. So that is indeed um, where things are heading. Data is not, um, you know, just there. Information is just not there and then it's gone again, but rather information um, can be saved now and then be used later. And this then raises the question, especially for the criminal um, law um, persons among us, 
how can we use that data that we saved in the past for present um, investigations? And that then is of crucial importance um, for the future, if you will, um, of that probable, probable cause concept. The second uh, implication um, of big data surveillance um, is that you don't only have and observe data and you don't only save that data on a server somewhere, but that ideally speaking with ideally, please put that in inverted commas, you also mean that you constantly in real time assess, evaluate, um, and, and analyze that data. So big data surveillance always um, implicate, implies um, the, the constant assessment, evaluation, use analysis um, of data. And this then leads us, if you will, um, or leads this big data surveillance um, society into what I would label a computational predictive society, where you try to predict certain um, um, facts of the future, certain behavioral patterns of the future based upon data of the past. You would like to see what's happening in the future in order to, well, and this is now getting big because we're talking societal um, here, to make good, inverted commas, possibly good political, economic, but also judicial um, decisions in the present. And so this is where, if you will, the, um, the temporal loop is closed. So you have past data that you analyze to predict future um, events, which are then channeled into your actions in the present to get, if you will, ahead of the future, to get ahead of um, something that will happen in the future. And there is many examples uh, where that is being used already. Think about algorithmic credit scoring. Think about predictive policing at the workspace. Um, think about hiring decisions, so labor law. Um, am I a good uh, employee? Maybe we should check my online, uh, my online um, profiles. I have none, and that makes me very suspicious, I presume. Um, um, so you probably shouldn't hire me in the first place, because there is nothing really to analyze. But these isn't, this is, as, as you probably know, this is not some fancy um, um, science fiction um, uh, that I'm recounting here, but this is being practiced um, that you do use um, data analytics um, to make, for example, hiring choices, or that you predict whether an employee is rather um, prone to corruption or not, and then that you can use to either have this person, this employee, in a in a risk um, a risk uh, sensitive um, working space or not. So. And this is, of course, then easily um, transferable to the criminal law division. Think about predictive policing. Um, so the use of um, data analysis, ideally speaking, as much data as possible, because ideally speaking it means here um, that the more data you have, the more patterns you can discover, which you have not discovered in the, pr uh, in the, in the past, because in the past humans were uh, not able to to process um, that amount of data and to see correlations in that data which was you know, not seeable by human, uh, by human eyes or by the human mind. So this is um, the idea um, that is behind the real-time evaluation of big data um, that you survey constantly. You might have the impression that I'm talking a little bit science fiction here, so that I'm going into the direction of Minority Report for all those who have either seen the movie or read the, um, the short story or even both. But this is actually where we are somewhat heading. Um, uh, Lucia Sedna, um, a colleague from, from, from Oxford, has already a couple of decades ago labeled um, a switch, um, a transformation in our focus points away from the classical post-crime idea, there was a crime committed and now let's, you know, let's investigate onto a pre-crime model um, of social control where we try to get ahead um, of um, that crime being committed in the first place. Now, in, in my, my, my prediction um, is 
and that not driven by um, by big data and not driven by artificial intelligence, but I hope a little bit by human intelligence, is that this is then the idea, the general idea, and, and that will come to bear in a big data surveillance society that we want to predict crime by algorithmic means and that we want to preempt crime so we could talk about if you will, predictive, algorithmically um, um, enforced predictive preemption as the driving moment, uh, the driving factor um, of criminal justice in the future. And this then leads me to um, a first reflection um, on whether this actually entails the end of normativity. Um, so what... Um, does a criminal law which is set to preempt crime before it is um, committed, is that uh, actually still criminal law? The Germans would probably say no, it's police law, but this is, an, uh, this is a distinction that no one outside of Europe or at least Germany understands. So I'll just collapse that and um, forget that question. Um, but I would even go a step further because there is legal theorists, um, not only in Germany but, but mainly in Germany, who say that with this, um, with this move, to, um, if you will, predictive analytics to um, analyzing, analyzing big data before something happens is actually entailing the end of, of law as law because law as norms um, rests on the condition that we as addressees of those laws have the factual possibility to not follow these norms in the first place. So, if you want to de define normativity as um, the possibility to either follow or not follow the law, those commands of the law, well then we really have a problem because um, the law as law as the possibility to counteract the law will be removed the more we try to you know, get in front of those, those situations, if we preempt crime by, for example, locking dangerous people away before um, they ca can commit the crime, well then, as I said, then um, that seemingly entails the end of normativity. And that, of course, challenges um, very much so the, the basis um, of our, at least very German um, thought, um, basis of criminal law um, in a liberal law imagination. Why? Because there is no longer a criminal act that you can commit. Because before you commit it, ideally speaking, you can intervene. There is no guilt, no responsibility for that criminal act, which both justifies but also limits um, a possible punishment. Because, well, you cannot if you can commit the crime, the criminal act, you can also incur at least this traditional idea of responsibility um, or even guilt. Um, so the, the point here is that instead of a command, you must not kill me, um, it, this command will re be replaced. This is a command which says, you know, I factually you could kill me, but I very much hope you don't. In the future, the idea would be that I have algorithmic predictions on all of you, um, where I see they're all not dangerous, so that essentially I know that you cannot commit the crime. So the command, thou shalt not kill, will be replaced by thou, thou, thou canst, I don't know, I don't know old English, thou canst not kill. Um, so how is this um, challenging um, our, um, is, is this realistic? And the answer is, I don't know. But what is realistic is that those very foundational reshapings of our imaginations of how the criminal law should work, from repression looking in the past, post-crime, to preemption looking into the future, identifying dangerous individuals by algorithmic means, that very 
transformation of how we conceptualize, ideally speaking, um, our social control, that has disruptive potentials. And this is where, what we can learn from the United States or in the United States, which have undergone that transformation from, if you will, post to pre-crime um, um, in the past by different means. There was an actuarial turn which set in in the 1990s where you try to identify dangerous individuals, the rotten apples, before they could, um, um, they could commit crime. And as Bernard Harcourt already wrote in 2007, this actuarial turn, this idea to predict and, and identify uh, the future to then preempt in the, in, the, in the present, that actuarial turn has already begun to shape our conception of just punishment, and it has become, I still quote, second nature to think about just punishment through the lens of actuarial predictions. Today, again, a quote, we have an intuitive but deep sense that it is just to determine punishment largely on the basis of an actuarial risk assessment. We have to come as to associate the prediction of future criminality with just punishment. This seems intuitively obvious, even necessary." End of quote. And what we see here is that is, of course, the very disruption of a, the classical liberal ideas of responsibility, backward-looking um, criminal law and criminal justice. Now, if we want to challenge this, um, I will just briefly mention a rather challenging um, a rather challenging um, argument that is difficult to get around with, especially if you're um, pr practicing criminal law um, from the investigative side. And that, that challenging thought is, um, isn't deviance something that we should cherish, that we should value? Um, so isn't deviance something that we need as a society to, to advance? Again, this is a challenging thought, but if we do not come to that conclusion, and if we do not try to, to, um, to at least underpin certain deviants with certain values, then it's very difficult to say why we shouldn't actually try to preempt crime by means of algorithmic predictions. And just to give you a couple of thoughts of why um, deviants might have some benefits for a society is first it induces change, so not every crime that um, was considered a crime, uh, not every um, deviance that was considered a crime uh, in the past is today still considered deviant or, for that matter, criminal. So transformation, change, um, is um, very much related to deviance, and this is to an extent only making more radical what Indra Spika has uh, said. Um, maybe if we want to use MP4s today, I guess, no, no longer MP3s, MP4s today, then we need to, at a certain uh, stage, overcome our tapes. But um, if we set, based on past data, um, also our criminal law in, uh, in stone and say this is deviant, this is criminal, this must be preempted, then there is no transformation. So we need uh, innovation and change and deviance can induce that for good or bad into a society at large. On the other hand, to make sure that you don't think that I, I cherish deviance and I just, that I cherish, uh, I don't know, killing sprees um, um, for the good of it, it also ha ha happens to help us to communicate and to reflect upon, to justify um, a certain um, amount um, um, of, or that we, we use justifications to really penalize, investigate, and then render judgment and punishment in the name of the people against those who acted criminally. If we only say we intervened before someone, ha someone happened and now we locked those people away, we never really have this public display um, of justifications necessary to say, in the name of the people, um, you have done wrong, and hence we sent you to, to prison. So deviance, both as a momentum of change, of transformation, and as a um, 
possibility to rethink, but also then to enter um, justificatory means to render punishment have their advantages. And without deviance, that is not possible. Since I'm, I think, ending um, my time, just two thoughts um, on, uh, on probable cause. If you think um, of all the information that is um, saved, um, not only by state agencies, but also by private, agent, by private enterprises or by, by individuals, only think about how all the GPS data that is here on my mobile phone or the photos that I have, wonderful, of course, um, uh, to, to get hold of that um, as a prosecutor. Um, if you think about this, um, the idea that probable cause um, has a limiting effect in the future is becoming unrealistic. And that has two, has two implications. First, um, traditionally speaking, probable cause, the idea that you need you know, some initial suspicion to start an investigation, had two, had two meanings. It represented a certain protection um, against uh, arbitrariness. So you couldn't just start, at least in Germany, an investigation because um, I don't like um, Indra's glasses. I mean, they look kind of fishy, right? So um, really, you should look into her a little bit more deep. Um, might be arbitrary. Um, might, well, but look at her glasses. Um, uh, and her earrings, and, and that she puts down her glasses now, that is especially suspicious. Um, so, sorry for being my victim today. Um, so, um, this is of course um, being made a little bit more problematic. If you have all the information necessary um, to, if you just look deep enough, well, you will find something and then um, this burden that you need to have some probable cause to you know, start a closer investigation, that is uh, being rendered almost ineffectual in a big data surveillance society. On the other hand, and this is uh, as problematic, uh, the idea that you need probable cause limited the work of investigators because only because uh, when you had some suspicion well, you had a certain, you know, momentum to, to, to start working. Um, today, if you have so much data available to you, um, there is so much suspicion around that you're crushed with work. And this also happens in Germany now with um, um, some very prominent um, um, white collar crime uh, context, the Cum-Ex scandal, I don't know whether you've heard of it, um, um, so that there is so much um, data being saved that certain prosecutorial offices in Germany are basically overwhelmed with data and hence suspicion that they can't actually do anything else than you know, um, try to, to somehow get um, 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 investigating that data. And, and so both elements of probable cause, traditionally speaking, protection against arbitrariness and um, a certain limitational aspect to investigatorial work is being put under severe challenges. Um, to cut a very long um, um, story short, I think um, before we now start to say this is all bad and, uh, and let's go back to the good old days, um, which is hardly realistic anyhow, we should come to appreciate that um, already in our, at least again, very German, and I would be very happy to learn uh, more um, how it's done in Brazil, in our German way of how we doctrinalize and practice this idea of, of Anfangsverdacht, of initial suspicion, of probable cause, it's already... Um, configured uh, in a way um, that it is very open to big data surveillance techniques. Already the language um, of traditional probable cause um, doctrines, überwiegend der Wahrscheinlichkeit, so a little bit more probable probability that something was, uh, um, uh, that a crime has been committed, 
already that indicates that we are um, already on a slippery slope with our current doctrines and back practices of um, probable cause again in Germany. So if we really, if that's again the question mark, we really want to get hold of um, probable cause in the big data surveillance society, we need also to critically reflect upon the status quo of our practices and doctrines today to then um, appreciate and see what we can do with this new technology coming in, which seemingly, but I really emphasize only seemingly transforms um, the criminal law and justice process, but which in reality, from a critical point of view, is only, only inverted commas, um, capitalizing and building upon these very bases that are already set in place and is um, um, not a, if you will, not a complete break with, not a complete transformation of that which was um, present in the past, but which is rather a continuation, an evolutionary process. Um, towards um, big data surveillance. And if we want um, to, if you will, put a stop to at least to some extent, to a stop um, of our societies being submitted to all the grand problems that uh, Indra Spika um, was so elaborately um, telling us about, then I think we already need to start with critically reflecting upon the status quo to then make a substantial critique of a, pu of a possible future criminal law in a big data surveillance society. Again, thank you so much for your attention and for the possibility to be here. Gostaria de agradecer bastante ao professor Christoph Burchard, é, que mostrou como é, essa temática da, da vigilância, tanto por parte do Estado quanto por empresas privadas, é algo que é transversal ao direito. Né? A professora Indra falou dos impactos de, do avanço da inteligência artificial sobre direitos fundamentais. É, e acho que um, um ponto de contato com a palestra do professor Burchard é, é não adotar uma visão seja excessivamente otimista, seja negativa sobre os potenciais da digitalização que frequentemente nós vimos. Né? Um otimismo exagerado no sentido de que é, digitalização é algo necessariamente positivo, isso vem, tem muito a ver com a nossa discussão aqui no município de Smart Cities, né? de, é, o, a digitalização como sinônimo de inte, algo positivo, inteligente, de algo que funciona, um certo otimismo ingênuo. É, e, por outro lado, também, às vezes, uma postura é, de setores talvez mais radicais é, ligados à proteção de dados, um certo uma rejeição a, ao avanço da digitalização como algo necessariamente é, ofensivo às liberdades. É, acho que é, as palestras né, foram muito ricas e, e equilibradas nesse ponto, destacar as potencialidades e os riscos da digitalização para os direitos fundamentais, é, no lato senso, especificamente para os direitos dos acusados em processos criminais. É, passo a palavra agora ao professor Ingo Sarlet, é, que falará sobre constitucionalismo digital e proteção de dados. O professor Ingo né, dispensa apresentações, evidentemente, mas é meu dever de ofício fazê-lo. Ele é professor titular de Direito Constitucional da PUC do Rio Grande do Sul e doutor pela Universidade de Munique. Passo a palavra ao professor Ingo. Bom, gente, mais uma vez, obrigado pelo convite. É um privilégio ter podido ouvir também as, os, a doutora Inda, a professora Inda, o professor Burchard, excepcionais apresentações, não podíamos ter começado melhor esse nosso seminário. Né? E eu vou exercer aqui algo que a nossa Suprema Corte não conhece muito bem, né? é só dos livros, que é um self-restraint. Agora, não aqui o judicial self-restraint, But, mas um discursive uh, self-restraint, né? porque nós já, de certa forma, passamos do tempo do, do primeiro painel, né? e eu, claro, também como um dos coordenadores científicos, não sou eu que vou, vou tomar o tempo do segundo painel, talvez um intervalo um pouco mais curto, eu também vou, portanto, não vou assim praticamente desenvolver a palestra inicialmente programada, mas talvez pudesse começar até com algumas observações também precedentes, né, da professora Inda e do professor Burchard, especialmente 
quando a professora Indra refere né, ao problema né, do, da ameaça e da erosão, digamos assim, da autonomia, eh, da individualidade. Eh, isso, evidentemente, também toca um tema que a mim é muito caro, né? eu diria autonomia, individualidade e dignidade da pessoa humana. Né? Afinal de contas, né, autonomia e individualidade são estritamente relacionadas ao valor e princípio, né? e também, para alguns, direito né? à dignidade da pessoa humana, né? e é por isso também que me parece que a dignidade da pessoa humana está é, extremamente colocada em causa, é, não só, evidentemente, em função de eventuais ameaças, riscos, né? a, a dignidade, como nós conhecemos, mas também a própria necessidade, talvez, de reconceituar ou de recompreensão, né? de reinventar também, pelo menos em parte, né? o sentido, manter aquilo que é essencial, mas também reinventar, que seja, em parte, o que nós entendemos por dignidade da pessoa humana eh, e aquilo que entendemos que é a função da dignidade da pessoa humana, né, como base, não de todos, mas especialmente os principais direitos fundamentais né, no contexto da digitalização. Acho que esse é um grande desafio. Né, temos um livro muito interessante do Ino Augsberg, né, e do e do Lader, né, sobre a função da dignidade da pessoa humana no Estado constitucional, eles já tocam lá alguma coisa nessa temática, mas, evidentemente, é um livro mais antigo. Né? E acho que essa atualização conceitual né, da dignidade pessoa humana, inclusive como parâmetro normativo, né, é, é fundamental também nesse, nesse, nesse contexto. Né? Da mesma forma, como nós estamos comemorando, eu acho que sempre é bom lembrar, né, acabamos de comemorar, e acho que é sim de comemorar os 35 anos da nossa Constituição Federal de 1988, também podemos perceber que a nossa Constituição, como tantas outras, né, é, tra traz exatamente alguns exemplos é, possíveis né, que mostram também o quanto o direito constitucional, o direito em si, reagem né, aos, aos, aos novos riscos, às novas demandas é, sociais, né, obviamente não no ponto de vista social, né, é, com inovação no direito, né, quer dizer, inovação pelo direito, inovação no direito. Né, temos um grande professor alemão que estará conosco no ano que vem, pessoalmente, né, que é o professor Hoffmann Riem, que trata muito sobre direito e inovação. Né, e, para quem não conhece o livro dele, traduzido em português, é, Teoria Geral do Direito Digital, né, um livro que vale muito a pena, né, e tem aqui, acho que tem algumas testemunhas né, do valor do livro dele. Né? Temos o Ricardo Campos, que também é amigo do professor Hoffman Rime, e tem, tem uma obra fantástica, né, não necessariamente sobre essa perspectiva, mas também, evidentemente, é um livro que foi premiado né, é, em Frankfurt, também tem um prêmio internacional, né, que é bastante uma, uma teoria também é, legal, também não só jurídica, né, mas também é, da digitalização do mundo digital. Então, se limita a isso, mas é um livro importante, já traduzido em, em português, mesmo de propaganda. Mas o que tange a nossa Constituição, né, basicamente proteção de dados, que é o meu tema, né, nós temos, obviamente, um, um, um início né, que foi muito, já foi amigo né, da proteção de dados no Brasil, né, já 35 anos atrás, em 88, que foi, obviamente, a criação do habeas data na nossa Constituição como bastante precoce em termos de constitucionalismo comparado, portanto, começamos cedo quanto a termos um instrumento específico à proteção de dados pessoais na nossa Constituição com status de direito fundamental, ação constitucional com status de direito fundamental, cláusula pétrea, portanto, né, e onde o Supremo, inclusive, já desde o início, né, segurou uh, esse regime pleno da fundamentalidade ao, ao, ao assegurar também a aplicabilidade, a aplicabilidade imediata dessas normas da, da, do habeas data, né, mesmo com a falta de lei regulamentadora né, do processo de habeas data, como nós sabemos, o Supremo admitiu né, que o habeas data fosse manejado né, judicialmente, já desde o início, né, recorrendo, portanto, né, à lei do mandato de segurança e subsidiariamente ao Código de Processo Civil. Portanto, tivemos ali um início muito positivo né, e precoce em relação à proteção de dados do ponto de vista constitucional. Né. Mas não tivemos, depois, do ponto de vista da jurisprudência do Supremo e também, digamos assim, é, é, uma evolução de uma cultura de proteção de dados no Brasil, como nós sabemos, né? sempre tivemos uma resistência a essa cultura de proteção de dados, salvo na doutrina, onde, evidentemente, temos muitos nomes que precocemente já se engajaram 
pela proteção de dados no Brasil, se está aqui apenas como exemplo, talvez mais proeminente, o professor Danilo Doneda, né? que também era professor da UERJ, né? e é egressa aqui é, da UERJ, com seu mestrado e doutorado feito aqui no Rio de Janeiro, né? que é um dos pioneiros, mas o pleito basicamente se limitava à esfera doutrinária. Né? E, e, de fato, né? foram, as, foram as circunstâncias que pressionaram essa inclusão do direito fundamental à proteção de dados pessoais só recentemente no nosso texto constitucional, né? e basicamente também a partir da pressão legislativa, a necessidade de, já que já tínhamos uma lei, né? embora a lei ainda não estivesse é, só gradualmente entrado em vigor, né? efetivamente nós sabemos que ela não entrou em vigor assim na sua plenitude, falta muito para entrar em vigor no que diz respeito à sua efetividade, né? mas basicamente o Supremo então acabou reconhecendo, ah, de forma evidentemente por caneta judicial, por golpe judicial, né, o direito à proteção de dados pessoais já em 2020, né, e depois num contexto que eu quero retomar rapidamente. Né. É, eu esqueci um detalhe quando falei da dignidade da pessoa humana, né, e, e que tem que é relacionado direito à democracia. Porque eu me lembrei né, das nossas lições de direito constitucional na Alemanha, né, sobre o conceito de democracia, e a ideia da dignidade da pessoa humana como do indivíduo não ególatra, mas do indivíduo socialmente responsável. Né? E essa ideia, justamente, me parece, para o ainda Speaker, que também faz parte desse contexto né, que a senhora referiu com relação à afetação né, da, do papel do indivíduo, digamos assim, na sociedade democrática. Parece também essa ideia do indivíduo socialmente responsável está se, está se perdendo, né? por se me perdoe voltar a esse tema. Né? Mas, com relação à produção de dados no Brasil, me parece que agora eu vou deixar, como o professor Rodrigo vai tratar desse tema também durante a tarde, combinei que faria só uma espécie de apresentação introdutória. Né? É, na verdade, esse, esse direito nasce no Brasil, como também nasceu na Alemanha e outros lugares, ligados a um problema clássico dos direitos fundamentais, que é o problema da legitimidade constitucional das restrições a direitos fundamentais. Né? Foi a partir da, de, um, de uma legislação né, que impôs né, uma intervenção restritiva a, a direitos fundamentais, né, que é aquela legislação, evidentemente, que não se limitava só àquilo, né, mas que impunha, né, no início da pandemia, a, a, o compartilhamento de dados da, de, das empresas de telefonia móvel e fixa né, com o IBGE, né, para fins de possíveis né, estatísticas e formatação de políticas públicas, inclusive de combate à pandemia, foi nesse contexto que o Supremo Tribunal Federal reconheceu esse direito a partir de outros princípios já eh, pré-existentes, já reconhecidos, inclusive também implicitamente positivados na Constituição Brasileira, porque nós também não temos autodeterminação informacional no nosso texto constitucional, também não temos um direito geral de personalidade no nosso texto constitucional, né? Portanto, foi a partir de até mesmo de alguns direitos que já eram implicitamente positivados que o Supremo acabou avançando em relação à proteção de dados pessoais. Eu quero só frisar esse contexto, né? num contexto né, onde estava a causa uma restrição a direitos fundamentais. Eu não vou aqui entrar no mérito se a decisão foi correta ou não, porque há, há discussões sobre se, de fato, isso era uma restrição desproporcional. Né? O Supremo poderia ter reconhecido o direito sem reconhecer uma restrição desproporcional. Né? Mas isso é outra conversa. Né? Mas foi nesse, nesse contexto, e num contexto ligado, que já foi referido, de compartilhamento de dados. De compartilhamento de dados. Né? É esse detalhe. O reconhecimento do direito fundamental enquanto autônomo, né? que é um outro problema. Né? Nós sabemos que quem lida com dogmática dos direitos fundamentais, especialmente né? Germanófica, germanoficamente orientada, né? é, tem um problema sempre quando se trata de definição do âmbito de proteção do direito fundamental. Né? E, embora a gente sustente que existe aqui um âmbito de proteção autônomo, porque é só assim que se pode compreender uma autonomia, é, ainda que muito relativa de um direito, é com relação a um espaço de proteção que não se sobrepõe exatamente ao espaço de proteção de outros direitos fundamentais, ainda é um pouco misterioso, né? Vamos ainda para descobrir melhor qual é esse espaço de proteção autônomo, de fato, do nosso direito fundamental à proteção de dados pessoais no sistema brasileiro, né? A constitucionalização, por sua vez, foi importante, né? podia não acontecer, em muitos países não aconteceu até hoje, a Alemanha até hoje não tem esse direito fundamental na construção, muitos outros países também ainda não o têm. Né? De qualquer sorte, 
há algumas vantagens, né? porque pelo menos não se pode dar, em princípio, um passo atrás. Né? Teoricamente, agora o Supremo Tribunal Federal não poderia mais dizer que não é um direito fundamental, né? mas sim é uma cláusula pétrea, portanto, nem mesmo o Congresso, né? com 100% de votantes, poderia, obviamente, mais subtrair esse direito do texto eh, constitucional. Acho que isso é uma conquista importante, né? mas mais importante é o fato de que, a partir desse direito fundamental, nós temos realmente um, uma espécie de manto né? eh, que cobre, né? que pode realmente nos, nos permitir eh, acessar, inclusive judicialmente, né? a proteção de dados pessoais eh, quando não há legislação específica, né? especialmente porque a própria LGPD, como nós sabemos, exclui do seu regime de aplicação várias áreas, inclusive uma área cara, o professor Burchard, né, que é a da investigação criminal, da persecução eh, penal, não exatamente do processo penal, que aí é um outro problema, né, uma separação, e da segurança pública. Né, a própria segurança nacional também não está coberta, pelo menos estritamente, pela LGPD. E é claro que o reconhecimento de direito fundamental é imprescindível para que se possa né, acessar a proteção também nesses domínios, que já tem sido feito, né, obviamente, em várias decisões do próprio Supremo Tribunal Federal, do nosso STJ, que é o BGH eh, da Alemanha. Então, essa função, eu, me parece, eh, é uma função crucial que esse direito fundamental já está exercendo, mas, evidentemente, não significa que não precisemos da regulação. Né? É, é, e temos já antes projetos da inteligência artificial, participou do Código Civil, também temos que modificar. Nós temos um anteprojeto na área da, da penal, chamada LGPD Penal, né, que todavia tem sido né, bastante mutilado, pelo menos no meu sentido, que era mesmo da comissão, né, pelo Congresso Nacional, embora ainda não esteja, obviamente, concluído o processo legislativo. Né, e aí eu volto né, à dimensão subjetiva e objetiva desse direito fundamental. Da subjetiva eu apenas vou referir porque isso aí eu vou deixar para o Rodrigo, né, toda essa parte, né, que ele com maestria, até o pós-doc dele é sobre isso. Né, é, é, e, de qualquer sorte, da parte da dimensão subjetiva me parece interessante, aí não sei se é a concordância, né, mas, pelo menos, a minha posição é, e não só a minha, de que, a partir do direito fundamental, né, nós podemos conceber o leque de posições jurídicas, os chamados direitos, o titular dos dados, a gente sabe que isso, esse termo titular dos dados... Né, também um pouco complicado, mas de qualquer sorte os direitos do eh, titular do direito à proteção de dados pessoais, elencado na legislação infraconstitucional, não é um número de clausos, não é um rol fechado. Né? Se pode deduzir, a partir de novas exigências, novas demandas, ou até já existentes, né? novas posições subjetivas, né? a partir da própria Constituição, né? seja pelo legislador, que pode concretizá-la, seja até mesmo né, na esfera do controle Judicial. Então, isso me parece importante deixar logo claro que é uma outra função desse direito, direito fundamental. Né? Pulando aqui uma série de questões para me encaminhar ao final, né? me parece que também aqui é, um peso importante, também referido já também de forma nas outras palestras também, em geral, também sobre o tema, da própria professora Inda Speaker, né, está a vinculação dos particulares aos direitos fundamentais. Isso tem sido um grande tema hoje, né, de como, evidentemente, se pode se, a vinculação dos particulares aos direitos fundamentais sempre foi uma discussão muito importante. Né, alguns dizem até um pouco, né, digamos assim, vazia e muito acadêmica, mas, de qualquer sorte, independentemente de qual teoria vai se sustentar sobre eficácia direta ou indireta dos direitos fundamentais nas relações privadas, evidentemente, onde não há lei, onde não há uma legislação específica, sem dúvida nenhuma, a importância de uma aplicação até mesmo direta dos direitos fundamentais às relações privadas, especialmente nas relações tão assimétricas de poder, também já referidas, que, inclusive, nós sabemos né, que se, praticamente se equivale ao poder de um Estado, mas boa parte das big techs tem mais orçamento, mais poder econômico do que a maioria dos Estados do mundo hoje, dos países do mundo hoje, né, nós sabemos, evidentemente, que negar uma eficácia direta dos direitos fundamentais, especialmente da produção de dados, como um dos exemplos, né, nesse domínio, me parece um erro, né, é, é, porque o ideal de uma eficácia é, é, indireta vai depender de o quanto realmente o legislador infraconstitucional né, for, de fato, concretizar essa proteção nesses domínios. Nós sabemos que tudo isso ainda está em andamento, né, inclusive 
no Brasil. Então, acho que o resgate disso é fundamental, talvez até mesmo a reconstrução dessa dogmática dos direitos fundamentais nas relações privadas é também fundamental. Né? E no que diz com as restrições, e por isso, por isso de fato, termino, né? já comecei basicamente com as restrições e termino com elas, né? a nossa... A nossa emenda, a emenda constitucional 115, que introduziu o direito fundamental à proteção de dados, previu uma reserva legal simples, né, diferentemente do sigilo das comunicações telefônicas, onde nós temos uma reserva legal qualificada, né, o que evidentemente dá e precisa dar, né, está correto, maior espaço de conformação ao legislador infraconstitucional, por um lado, né, é, por outro lado também abre mais espaço né, à, à ponderação porque, evidentemente, quanto mais é, uma reserva legal qualificada, mais a lei, já, a, a própria a Constituição já estabelece exigências prévias, né? menos espaço tem o legislador, em princípio também, em tese, né? menos espaço de levar as questões da ponderação teria o, é, tem, ter, teria o juiz. Né? Na, proteção, na proteção do sigilo das comunicações telefônicas, né? a Constituição veda categoricamente que ela possa ser, não possa, possa ser de, por outra autoridade, senão o juiz ela possa ser para outras fins, se não para investigação e para o processo criminal. Portanto, ali nós já temos, não há o que ponderar. Se isso acontece, é uma inconstitucionalidade, não precisamos avançar esse domínio misterioso, né, subjetivo da ponderação. E é claro que na Reserva Legal Simples isso tem um aspecto é, bastante diferente, tanto que hoje se discute, né, e me parece que esse é um dos desafios, é, em que medida também para a proteção de dados pessoais se pode exigir, como se exige na, no sigilo das comunicações telefônicas, uma reserva de jurisdição na prévia necessidade de autorização judicial. Né? LGPDAL, LGPDAL, se previu algumas hipóteses, né? mas nós sabemos que isso é controverso, né? e de qual me parece que é muito necessário que também se crie, especialmente no direito penal, né? aqui, pelo menos em algumas situações, uma reserva de, uma reserva de jurisdição. Né? Então, outra, outro problema, evidentemente, é a definição aqui, não só do alcance do teste de proporcionalidade, mas da própria ideia de núcleo essencial, que é outra ideia um pouco né, é, complexa, né, é talvez fácil de definir, né, é realmente muito difícil de identificar e concretizar. Mas, é evidente, ela também vai passar a ter um papel central né, nesse debate de, dos limites do próprio direito fundamental à produção de dados pessoais. Né. É, em termos de perspectivas, e com isso eu termino, né, é, nós, obviamente, temos muito muito andar, porque o reconhecimento na construção de um direito fundamental é, de longe é suficiente para torná-lo efetivo. Né? Nós temos muitos exemplos de direitos fundamentais é, que têm baixo nível, né, ou até baixíssimo nível de efetividade, de eficácia social. Né? É evidente que, é, se a própria LGPD ainda é uma lei né, cujos dentes, é não tigre, né, cujos dentes né, mal estão começando a crescer, né, ainda são dentes de leite, né, e sei lá se vão ser capazes de morder o suficiente, né, eh, e a mordida vai poder se dar na medida que a NPD, a nossa Autoridade Nacional de Produção de Dados, vá se empoderando né, ao, longo, ao longo do tempo, que é um outro desafio, né, nós, é claro, temos ainda muito a aprender. E sem uma cultura, sem uma autovinculação né, do poder eh, econômico, sem uma autovinculação eh, do governo, dos atores estatais, sem uma autovinculação eh, de nós, indivíduos, em relação a esse direito fundamental, né, sem autovinculação também à proteção de dados, talvez no Brasil né, eh, siga ainda por muito tempo tendo uma efetividade né, longe do desejável. Mas, como disse, temos que ser otimistas, acho que passos estão sendo dados, regulatórios, passos também na jurisprudência, né, não só do Supremo, estão sendo dados, né, ainda bastante erráticos, mas me parece que o futuro, nesse aspecto, né, ele é menos ruim, bem menos ruim do que talvez alguns possam imaginar. Né, e espero que daqui a 10 anos, nos 45 anos da Constituição Federal, se ainda vivo estiver, né, nós possamos ter um diagnóstico, inclusive, mais positivo dessa evolução. Então, muito obrigado pela atenção né, e acho que fiquei no tempo. É, muito obrigado ao professor Ingo é, pela autocontenção, pela... Ficou absolutamente adstrito ao tempo pela palestra brilhante. O professor Ingo também tem sido um pioneiro na matéria do direito fundamental à proteção de dados. Assim, ele tem trabalhos que 
não só foram pioneiros, mas estruturaram a dogmática desse direito fundamental e contribuíram muito, inclusive, para o reconhecimento judicial pelo Supremo e depois pela emenda constitucional que reconheceu esse direito fundamental como um direito fundamental autônomo. Então, agradecer novamente, estamos com pouco tempo, né? bateu exatamente agora o tempo de, desse painel, então não teremos muito mais tempo para perguntas, mas de todo modo pergunta a plateia se há alguma questão, é, algum questionamento, alguma pergunta, algum comentário aos palestrantes. Senão vou me valer da condição de presidente da mesa para fazer uma pergunta. É, já me valendo, é, gostaria primeiro de perguntar é, uma questão pontual, não que, que me pareça simples, mas é pontual à professora Indra, sobre é, de que maneira os avanços na inteligência artificial tornam obsoleto o GDPR e, consequentemente, a nossa Lei Geral de Proteção de Dados brasileira, que é muito é, inspirada no GDPR. E aí um parênteses para fazer uma propaganda aqui do melhor livro que, é, na minha opinião, temos sobre o GDPR, que é o livro acabado de lançar pela professora Indra e outros coordenadores, uma análise, é, um comentário de artigo por artigo, muito rico nos principais professores europeus. E recomendo fortemente, inclusive, porque a nossa lei é bastante inspirada no GDPR. Mas sobre a compatibilidade dos avanços de inteligência artificial e o GDPR, de que maneira a ideia de autodeterminação informativa é, é incompatível com os avanços de inteligência artificial? É, tendo em vista que a ideia de autodeterminação informativa é que o titular é o, é o indivíduo, é o titular de dados, portanto, é, a possibilidade de controle pressupõe transparência e instrumentos reais de controle por parte do titular. De que maneira a opacidade do funcionamento dos algoritmos é, inviabiliza tanto a transparência quanto o controle e torna Toda a estrutura, a base teórica do GDPR e da LGPD, que é a autodeterminação informativa, obsoleta. First of all, thank you for showing this. And Christoph already said that it has two purposes. One is to educate us and the other is to commit homicide. <laughs> um, uh, the question, of course, is super, and I thank you, because it allows me to speak just a very little bit about the interaction between humans and technology. And I think that's behind the question. Yeah. Um, if we have AI, it's a tool, so let's use it as a tool. And let's identify where it makes sense to have it, where it is good, and where it is not. And the only regulation we have presently is in the GDPR. Um, And that is, in Article 22, there is the requirement for any automated decision to be taken by or to be accompanied by a human being. And that is sort of a door opener that we have right now. And both the European Union and Brazil are thinking alike. And um, I was just in Brasilia uh, where an Italian colleague presented uh, a comparative approach and, and very clearly showed that the AI regulatory approach of Brazil is better than the EU one. And I would say, yes, it is, immediately. Um, but we don't have it yet. So the only thing we have so far is this stupid Article 22. And data protection has always not been interested in data protection, but in the power that you gain by processing data. So that is not lost if we're talking about AI, but I think it becomes even more urgent, really, because that is sort of the material, and I don't want to use, in particular, not in Rio, the data as oil, blah, 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 kind of metaphor. Um, but but the core essence of um, Zimitis, who was behind this book, in a way, um, the, the German-Greek professor who really founded the idea, uh, together with people from Yale and, and super international, um, was always to restrict the the power asymmetry that grows out of digital tools, automated decision making. And I think that is as true as ever, like I said in my presentation. We're not talking about fundamentally new things that has all been there in the 50s and 60s and already started to be thought through. So this book is still valid, and this is not marketing. <laughs> Thank you very much, Indra. And uma pergunta. One question to Professor Bouchard. 
É, esse tema da, de modelos preditivos em matéria de investigação criminal é, é um tema muito caro ao Brasil e, particularmente, aos municípios. Né? O avanço da ideia de smart cities, é, discussões sobre reconhecimento facial e compartilhamento de dados é, obtidos por esses instrumentos municipais, autoridades policiais, que, no caso brasileiro, é, não são municipais, são estaduais, são, é um outro ente federativo, mas há esse compartilhamento de imagens. É, e, assim, isso vem sendo apresentado como um avanço em matéria de investigação criminal. O que, em alguma maneira, é, porque, tendo em vista a realidade do combate à criminalidade no Rio de Janeiro, é, um modelo alternativo é um modelo de enfrentamento. Né? Temos áreas ocupadas por facções criminosas em que, muitas vezes, a polícia tem que entrar em um modelo de guerra, verdadeiramente, com, com grande risco à população civil. É, e, e, de alguma maneira, o uso de instrumentos de inteligência artificial e tecnologias, em geral, tende a minimizar esses riscos mais físicos, mais prementes, é, e, e, de alguma maneira, é, esses riscos são, é, é, não são muito temidos no Brasil, porque estamos diante de, de riscos talvez maiores. Mas, evidentemente, eles existem, sobretudo em relação a, ao aspecto da, da igualdade, né? o risco de discriminação em relação à condução de, das investigações, tendo em vista alguns é, preconceitos. É, de que maneira, é óbvio que... A nossa realidade é muito diferente em relação à questão do, de valorizar os desvios. Nós, talvez porque no Brasil os desvios são um pouco mais é, frequentes do que na Alemanha, a gente tende a, 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 a ter mais medo do, é, do desvio e tende a aceitar melhor modelos preditivos que evitem desvios que são é, tão frequentes. Então, de que maneira... É, você vê, é óbvio que a realidade é distinta, né? é difícil analisar a partir da nossa realidade, mas é, a aplicação dessas questões no modelo é, em que as, é, a questão da investigação criminal toca diretamente vários outros direitos fundamentais, como é o modelo de enfrentamento das polícias, as facções criminosas no Brasil. Thank you so much for this question. This was um, also excellent, and and it gives context and perspective. Um, I maybe I'll I'll just answer like this. Um, in, in my eyes, AI or predictive models are are a tool, but they are also socio technical systems. And and tools or socio technical systems change us. Um, And and once we're being, once we have been changed as a society, as individuals, um, then it's very difficult to undo those changes. Um, think about a very seemingly, um, a seemingly very bizarre example, but think about. Um, uh, I'm not going into toasters, um, but l let's go into into the bow. Um, so um, having a, a bow and arrow um, that changed us as a society because we didn't have to, you know, face the the animal when hunting, but we could um, hunt from afar. And and AI and and predictive models tools they also and and today we can't actually imagine that we uh, you know hunt our food directly face to face and i think that the same will happen uh, once we use ai um, so it is changing the way we think the way we act um, as investigators but investigators um, are also citizens and and we're living in then in a in a society where these predictive models are being thought of as something normal as usual inevitable they become second nature And the question then is, um, how does that change us? Does it change for the good? Um, how does it, for example, once we go predictive, um, what is left of autonomy? I mean, the whole discussion of criminal guilt, et cetera, is basically a discussion of human autonomy um, uh, and responsibility that is you know, dependent on the idea that we are autonomous uh, beings. Um, once that is taken from us um, and we don't actually think 
as humans, as autonomous, uh, responsible beings, something has changed, and it's very difficult to undo. So I fully feel that um, it's, it's, um, there is a, a strong movement to smart cities and that it is crucial to keep um, um, law enforcement personnel really physically safe. Um, I fully uh, agree and this is of utmost importance. As usual, when a lawyer starts like this, there is a small but, uh, and, and that small but is have we or have you discussed in 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 greater depths that which can happen not only you know on 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 a short term basis keeping law enforcement personnel safe on for a dem for the democracy at large and and my my biggest issue when it comes to ai is that i'm not Anti-AI, anti-AI. That's that's it. Anti-AI. Um, uh, but what I'm very much pro is that we need to have bigger societal discussions of what happens once we use those tools, and I think this is the, the crucial uh, the, the crucial question now. How do we get these discussion into the society at large? So that um, it's it's not um, as if it's inevitable that we need to use it. So let's use it, and then something has changed, and we it's very difficult to undo. I think now we have to really have those bigger um, societal discussions of possible impending transformations um, with the technologies that we use, and and we shouldn't be turning a blind side to to. The idea of of AI being a socio technical system that transforms us if we use it too rapidly um, and um, um, unthoughtfully. So this is m maybe not a very precise answer, but m m the best I can, could give you is, um, of course, um, Im very important to use these tools, but. Let's have the bigger discussion as well, uh, because these discussions need to be, ha we need to have them, otherwise we'll find ourselves in a world which we might today not, do not want to live in in the future, uh, and where we were driven at um, by forces that, that took over, and I'm not saying the, 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 the conspiracy type forces, but rather the technological forces of development and innovation that have developed their own, you, to an extent, life. Thank you very much, Christoph. Thank you very much, Indra. Obrigado, Ingo. Então, declaro encerrado esse painel. Vamos fazer uma parada para o café e voltamos em 10 minutos, no máximo. Muito obrigado.